and the making and the roles that we as individuals can play. I believe that being a maker can be a very powerful position in society. And I like the opportunity to explore that. So I say that Silicon Valley Robotics is my day job. And that is a similar kind of ecosystem. It is about bringing together a whole range of innovative companies in robotics and AI who are developing new processes in manufacturing. And so my day job is seeing that, but like many of us, my weekend job turned into producing PPE. And I very much learned the difference between making one, making 10, and making a hundred, a thousand or more. And I started to think that my idea of what a makerspace is and was has been incredibly informed by the Fab Lab movement and what is personally, what is available to consumers for making. And I think it's time that we change that. So I proposed a session from maker to micro factory and I've invited two of my friends to to speak about that. And what I'd like to do now is ask Jason and Dan to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what they do. And then we're going to dive in a little bit more to the topic. And if you've just joined us and you have questions at any time, please post your questions into the chat. And I'm really looking forward to turning this into a discussion because I believe that this is an, uh, really a new idea. And in the same way that Dale Doherty has been sharing his Plan C, Citizen Response, I think we need to reevaluate the tools that we're giving makers as well. And hence the idea of maker to micro factory. So Jason, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, my name's uh, Jason Hampton Taylor. I'm from Haddington Dynamics. Now, um, Haddington Dynamics um, over the last few years have developed a pretty innovative robotic platform. Um, and um, our feature product is what we call Dexter. Uh, so Dexter is a uh, seven axis robot, um, largely built using high strength 3D printings. And, um, and we additionally have started manufacturing in our own micro factory. So thus, that's why I've certainly been in, uh, part of this conversation with Andrew for a little while. Now, um, our strategy going forward is to roll out multiple micro factories. So, um, you know, the, the idea rather than having to produce our robot in a, um, a traditional manufacturing sort of environment of a large factory, we have determined that a cellular micro factory network is the best way forward for us. And I'm sure I'll talk about that a little bit further. So that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Uh, Dan, would you like to explain a little bit about yourself and Circuit Launch and your journey to get to Circuit Launch? Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Andre. I'm Dan O'Mara. I am uh, the CEO and community manager at Circuit Launch. We're a community workspace um, with shared labs and co-working for um, hardware electronics of all sorts. And so I kind of started in back in the days of the, the tech shop as well and uh, created my own product. It was the uh, portable standing desk, Ninja standing desk. And uh, I, from that process, went from the idea, from my idea, all the way through crowdfunding, through creating a um, a my own. I did most of my own manufacturing, except for certain key parts. And so, and then now I've gone on to uh, help Circuit Launch build and be uh, guide many of our community members who are going from the very beginnings of prototyping to um, mass manufacture and micro manufacture and on all levels in between. And so I'm, I'm happy to uh, to lend any. Uh, any wisdom or uh, ideas or thoughts uh, to and answer any questions that people have. That's great. And I see uh, a number of um, attendees, I think, have got, I expect, have got some background themselves in this area. And I'd love it if everybody could put a little uh, 
introduce themselves in the chat so that we can understand a little bit about the background. We really like to call on you all to help me solve the question that is really being posed here. What equipment, based on our experiences, particularly making PPE recently, and by the innovation in equipment, what equipment should a modern makerspace have to enable it to really be giving us access to local manufacturing? Because our usual suite of tools, which is um, primarily 3D printers and laser cutters, and if you're lucky, CNC machines, didn't turn out to be what we ended up needing and using or building in this period of response to COVID. Um, so that's a question I'm posing to everybody. What is the equipment we really need? And I'm going to ask both Jason and Dan to chime in with the sorts of things that they've run into in this last few months as the sort of tool that we wish we had uh, or wish we'd had. And, um, and then I'm going to answer a question that someone, I, I'm going to ask both Jason and Dan to answer the question that we've got in the Q&A. So first off, take a stab, um, Dan, what's the equipment that we've needed? And, and indeed, what equipment has been purchased over the last three months at Circuit Launch? Um, so, I mean, I think the one that really got us the most excited there recently is the die cutter. Um, mm -hmm. They're actually fairly inexpensive. Um, you can get dies manufactured. You can actually make your own dies. Um, and that's something that for, for parts, the, uh, the origami face shield is what we've been doing for the, the PPE. And it, uh, it, that has sped up things to close to about 200 an hour rather than doing through something like laser cutting or other ways of cutting. And that's been something that's been, been really kind of revolutionary for us. And we're looking excited and expanding upon that. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think a, a lot of the traditional stuff that we have from uh, 3D printers to uh, laser cutters, I mean, the laser cutter, I think, is the most under um, underused thing in manufacturing, micro manufacturing, I think, or um, I think it we could have a full expansion of that um, going there, particularly with, um, you know, in our future hopes is to really have a uh, uh, one that cuts um, uh, thin uh, steel that's still a, a CO2 laser. Um, and then the the big realization still is, is that we love our 3D printers, but they're still slow. They're, they're not quite set up, you know, in many ways until you find the way of, uh, of really creating a much more, more, you know, many of them or working with small uh, service bureaus that can actually help us with those. So those are some of the, the, the quick highlights of, I think, what we've, we've learned um, on uh, mm -hmm. where to make, make all of these amazing things. Okay, well, I'll just chime in there with a couple of the little things that um, I've purchased a couple of rotary cutters and we cut not just um, fabric, but PET plastics and so forth. And one of them is still in the PPE factory that was set up at Hot Rod Shop. And uh, one of them's at Circuit Launch. So that just turned out to be a really handy purchase. And Circuit Launch has a vacuum former, which I've seen a few makerspaces starting to make use of in uh, designing uh, certain masks. And I think that's an underutilized and really affordable piece of equipment. But also I am completely new to this idea of the plastic welding. And I think um, Circuit Launch has just purchased or is, is people are uh, experimenting at the moment with the uh, plastic welding that can be used to augment the mask making. Yeah, there's quite a few spots there. I think to add it to your rotary cutter, there's a, an amazing tool that I think is on our, our buy list is, is a, um, and honestly, I, I have to figure it, go to look at my notes to see what it's called, but it actually, it's uh, pattern makers or um, a, a cutting house in the sewing industry uses them all the time where you literally lay stacks out, you know, layers and layers of fabric and then cut your, uh, your patterns out all at once. And so those are, those are things that are, um, there are many tools like that as you get into kind of the, the manufacturing that you learn that some of the, the core tools that these smaller manufacturing places, locally and larger places have that just speed things up immensely. And so I think that there's still a lot of um, very 
specialty manufacturing tools that are available that I, I don't think are really known a lot by the, the makerspace mm. world makers that um, are, there's still so many cool things. Like, I mean, a die cutter would be another perfect example of that. Just a, it's a yes. specialty manufacturing tool that is not out of the reach of a lot of uh, smaller professionals um, and makers and, and maker spaces that can really revolutionize micro manufacturing. Okay, now time is going to fly, and we do have a question about how do we make the dyes. So perhaps you can spend a few minutes just describing that process to uh, people. That one I would have to refer to uh, uh, Alex, our CEO. He's been doing most of the research on that. But there's, um, you can, as, from what I've noticed, is that you can actually build um, either uh, plastic or 3D printed uh, bases, and then you actually uh, um, put I believe like a thin she sheet of metal and actually bend it around all of the creases so that when it cuts, it actually is cutting out in there. So um, that would be one I would have to, to all of the specifics, but there are, there are ways to make your own dyes. Um, in general, I think it's probably more efficient to just have one ordered, but um, if you, you know, are on a, on a budget and have a little bit of know-how like we all sometimes do there, it is possible, which is something that I don't think a lot of people knew. Oh, handy. And that really segues into talking to you, Jason, because, you know, we're starting to get into the whole topic of what tools can make the tools or make these um, more advanced manufacturing tools easier to customize, to operate and to afford. Yeah. Now, so, you know, we did um, bring in some um a laser cutting device into our workflow during the during the pandemic sort of response and we did you know produce quite a few ppes and and also valves for the for the local uh, nevada state hospital but one of the things that we were sort of really working on was the idea of adapting existing existing technology to put in automation so basically a the the, the uh, glowforge um device the laser cutter we were using we actually adapted and probably uh, invalidated the warranty, unfortunately, but we, we actually managed to, and we've got some videos of it, we actually managed to roll feed um, a, uh, a plastic that we were then laser cutting and then using our Dexter to automate the sort of stacking and pick and place of that. So, so the idea is getting an existing bit of equipment, which is a human centered bit of equipment, which requires a human user interface, if you like, and replacing that human user interface with a robot, which could do it obviously without um, any cross contamination with contact free, if you like. So that was one of the projects we did. And, and in fact, it was, it was a, more of an exercise in exploring the idea of adapting the existing equipment using our automation techniques. Um, we, um, we also have brought in sort of various visions. I suppose what we've been, we were focused on during this time is to the idea of adapting our micro factory structures to use more remote uh, automation. So talks of vision systems and so forth and telepresence was some of the things that we were using to sort of probably increase our um, uh, our, our capabilities in this space. So coming back to now the question about um, Fab Labs and Makerspaces was, uh, is where a lot of people really first explored 3D printers in the early days. And what's the new technology that Makerspaces should have? And well, I'm going to say robots right from the get go. But it's um, robots are only just becoming affordable. And to date, there have not been robots sub, say, $15,000 price point that have had any sort of real industrial reliability or precision. And that's all about to change. And speaking about Dexter from Haddington Dynamics, one of the things that has changed in Dexter is that the majority of the robot is 3D, 3D printed. So the actual process of manufacturing the robots is shifting. Well, absolutely. That, and that gives us um, several operational advantages. Firstly, um, we have been able to iterate different improvements and designs with our uh, Dexter, which has been a, you know, a, a fantastic way to do that with the high strength 3D printers we use. We're also experimenting with a range of 3D printers as well. We're looking at, um, you know, Mark Forge has the strength, but we're also looking at HP and, and we even use some of the Prusas. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a blend of technology for the best at place. 
But um, I suppose um, you're right. I mean, there is a huge operational advantage of of actually using 3D printers for short to medium um, production. And yeah, you, uh, Dan said right that uh, 3D printers traditionally quite slow. Um, but if you've got 20 3D printers, that's 20 times faster than one. And I suppose that is the idea of our 3D print farm networks, is that we get a critical mass of 3D printers and we can actually get fairly you know, good medium to vol medium to low volume manufacturing, which is often what's required. The problem is we, if we were going down a traditional route and tooling for injection molding, it would cost us millions and millions of dollars to even just do the tooling. And then we're stuck with sort of minimum order quantities of a thousand to to then start to have a, a a huge incentive to sell a lot of robots just to pay for the for the first stage of our thing. What we're looking to do is, like I said, to roll out our micro factories. We've already set one up here in Australia, and we've got one in in uh, in Vegas as well. We're looking to expand more of them into our network. What we're also seeing is, you know, whilst the uh, micro factories themselves give you some operational advantages and you know, the ability to bring in um, high tech um, robots with a good, you know, industrial duty cycle into a into a small operating system, a, a small factory, the network of factories as we grow our network will also help. Um, we'll be able to load balance our supply lines. We'll be able to um, have robot manufacturing in places like Australia, which we already have, where we find we're actually exporting back to the States. So, so basically the idea of having um, an extension, I suppose, of the, micro fact of, of the, of the makerspace concept is, is more of a formalized microfactory where we have, um, rather than as much R&D, we have also production capabilities and, and income, hopefully, as well. So, um, and we can go into that. Oh, we have, we're sort of pushed for time. And I could give another half hour on the subject, no doubt. But Oh, yes. Sort of well, I, we have just been told that we can continue. I know the stopping point is supposed to be at 3.30, but we, we can, okay, 3.45, we can continue answering questions then. And perhaps that would give us an opportunity to show one of the videos. I, I see James... Um, has posted the video of Dexter working with the laser cutters. Now, I got a lot of inbound interest from places like uh, Harvard saying, hey, we're putting students to work making testing kits. Do you have a robot that we could use instead? Because we need to make 100,000. Um, and it's a very simple job. Like we just need something to dip sticks into glue and then into something else and put them in a box. And the reality is to date, we have very few robots that are capable of industrial automation that can be repurposed rapidly. Um, and so what I'm delighted with is starting to see that. And the idea that every makerspace has a couple of robot arms that can be used to augment any particular jobs that are going on, I see that as really just training us all up in the ways that we can start to utilize automation. But um, there's a factor beyond that. You're heading into the kind of the rep wrap territory with the the either the micro factory that's building the robots, potentially developing the capability to build all of the micro factory, or indeed Absolutely. the robots to build the robots. And I'm I'm going to I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I suppose that is the ultimate dream, robots building robots, and certainly that may put fear in some people's hearts, but, but the idea that we have, we start with our own challenges um, within the micro factory. So, um, you know, we, for example, um, it, it takes quite a while to put our wiring looms together. Um, presently, we're developing a system internally to be able to automate that process of putting the wiring looms together, which is, a, you know, not something exclusively that we would want. So we, we, we're building capabilities internally to help us automate our process, which would essentially become a commercialized product outside of the micro factory. There are, you know, as we build this, there are lots of companies that want automated wiring loops. So this becomes something that, you know, we can build internally, test internally, and then deploy as a product and a solution for other 
other companies. Again, building more of a repertoire for our, our micro factories and how they can solve problems in the community. But absolutely, ultimately, we, we see a micro factory in a shipping container where we can deploy to places where maybe there's a, there's a need, emergency requirements for, for parts quickly, you know, being able to iterate. Um, an, another factor of 3D printing, which is not often explored, is the fact that a 3D printer can encapsulate parts you know, we call it sort of pause at the pause at height function in most 3D printers, which means we can we can determine that layer 50, we pause the printer, place a bearing or some sort of unit inside the printer. We've even designed a cyclolial drive, which we stop the printer about five times to you know encapsulate different devices. We end up with a drive system. So the the, the reason I mentioned that is a part of that is. It, it, having somebody standing there 24 hours a day trying to put things in and waiting for the printers to stop is clearly an area where automation can work. So whilst, um, you know, the 3D printers, sorry, the, 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 the robots can tend the 3D printers, they can also do that. We call that heterogeneous direct digital manufacturing is another way of manufacturing. So the 3D printers become absolutely essential. Um, and and absolutely, yeah. As as we as we grow, we we expect as we deploy more and more micro factories around the world, we see them developing their own technologies, being influenced by maybe they have a footprint in the medical mm. device, food production, many many things. We mm. see a micro factory network becoming self aware, if you like, being able to sort of help each other, you know, in, okay. a, in, a, in a yeah. Um, make sure that you put your contact information into the chat, Dan, I'd say the same thing for you and the circuit launch information. And now, one of the things that I love my, is Silicon Valley Robotics is based at circuit launch. And one of the reasons is that anybody who's coming to speak to me to understand what's happening in robotics, I can show them a lot of what's happening because of the other companies that are, uh, that are around me in the space because of the equipment and so for example i'm learning all the time about new features um, the palette for example that allows you to mix together four different filaments precisely to change either the color or the actual material or texture of 3d printers that's an amazing device that just like gives 3d printers superpowers and it's kind of affordable, but I would never have run into that if I wasn't at Circuit Launch. And so I see Circuit Launch having an incredible role at perhaps showcasing some of these innovative technologies like the robots and the micro factory production. But Dan, you're also looking beyond that into the ability to provide um, a, a, an education platform. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning of your question, but... Uh, but uh, oh, well, just I'll... tell us about the education platform, <laughs> too much of me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think that <clears throat> when we look at kind of um, hardware engineering education right now, things, I mean, we have a lot of very traditional uh, programs, but they're still not uh, preparing people as well as most of these uh, robotics industries would, would like to be able to jump in and go. Um, as well as I think that there's a such a... Um, the, the maker movement has created the self-education process of immense proportion and the things that can be done are, are you know, on the cutting edge and many of the, the makers that I know have gone on to take their idea and brought it on to a full-fledged business. And so um, what that really inspired us to do is, is we're beginning a pilot program for a, uh, a non-linear uh, project-based education system for hardware engineering where uh, we will be able to really create profile or uh, portfolio projects for people to either um, present on their resumes or to, to, as well as to develop for their, their startups and their businesses, or just to fill in the skill gaps that they don't have um, through self-study. Um, and I think that we're in an opportunity now, particularly even with the, the COVID, is just to really kind of change the way that people are learning. And that what that will really do is just be able to get people in to learn uh, new skills and join in communities and guided, guided by the kind of the brain trust that is, you know, at Circuit Launch and in other places to really kind of learn these new skills and change the way we manufacture, change the way we uh, 
apply to, to jobs, the way we build companies, everything. And so that's kind of what I'm involved in um, as of late and very excited about. And I think that the, the micro manufacturing movement really is, is that it, it's core to that because people are going to need, um, that's kind of like the thing that at least I've seen in all of, in my business and other businesses that like stopping of like, well, you know, being a maker is one thing and that's, you know, wonderful. But when you take that idea and want to actually make more than a few of them, there's some really big, um, unknowns that a lot of people don't know. And I think that, that we're still just trying to figure out how to teach that stuff, how to teach manufacturing, how to, how to learn, because it, um, it takes such an individualized approach that because manufacturing now is so different than even it, it was. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, where what we're hoping to be able to provide to the to our community and and the you know area oh, that, whole. that's great and you're actually starting to run a pilot program i believe for people that want to increase their portfolio skills and okay. i think they can get in touch with you if um anybody here is interested now to to me the key thing is is it's we can do a heck of a lot online but they're are often things that you that is very difficult to learn completely online particularly when it's relating to building hardware or learning how to operate machinery of course so i think um circuit launch can be a really good gap filler in between the education that happens elsewhere and or online and being able to provide like covid compliant um, access connections to the community and and to the equipment uh, and contact oh right um can we reshare the contact info and make sure that you um i think jason you've just done that select attendees as well otherwise it might just default back to only panelists And um, one uh, little note, although I know people have to move on to other sessions, uh, Synbio Beta is organizing a free one day workshop on June the 3rd that looks fascinating. And I, I saw someone who was attending had a background in developing um, in, in the bio manufacturing area, which is a, a, something that Circuit Launch is just getting into. And it's certainly an area that I'm aware there is a real demand for robots to be involved in this process. So I'm very interested in learning more about the current state of the art in biomanufacturing technology and how we can start innovating around processes in that. And I think this, the event on June 3rd will be a great opportunity to, um, to learn more about that. I'll put the link in the chat if I get a chance, but it is from Symbio Beta. And in fact, you know, Circuit Launch has expanded now to have um, a, a basic bio lab facility and uh, an industrial sewing facility, as well as augmented reality and virtual reality. So it's an incredible opportunity to have a showcase for the latest innovations in all of these spaces. And I think that's really one of the great strengths of maker spaces. And it's why I'm questioning at the moment, what exactly should makerspaces have? And I think that every makerspace will have robots in the future, but it's taken a while just for us to hit the affordability thing. And um, Jason, can you tell us a little bit, Dext is open source, isn't it? And people can um, purchase a range of things. You can purchase just like, I think the basic um, parts and 3D print all of the rest yourself and so on can you just step that out for us yeah we listen we have a number of different programs where we we um, can sell people just the kit form of the robot um and you know what we have is an open source um scenario where you know clearly people can't do uh, derivatives and, and and put an ip on that so certainly that protects us within the open source sort of uh, system 
what we have have done, however, is 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 release completely all the files for our for our last model. So we have a an HD model, which was our previous model, and we've we've already sort of delivered that to some sort of STEM opportunities and places like that, where where kids are now building these in Australia and some a couple of Australian schools. Um, the the latest version, our HDI version, is is sort of partially open source, if you like. So we 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 keep the the print files. Um, ab absolutely outside of general release, while we, we al allow the micro factories that are going to be producing these to be able to sort of use those. So, so there is a way of, 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 of getting a full robot, um, you know, together with your own uh, print files, which we publish on Thingiverse, for example, and, and to, to explore the previous model. The existing model is something that we keep in, internally for our micro factories as, as, as that sort of expands the routine around that. But, um, but you're right. Yeah, you know, training is, I want to pick up on what Dan mentioned, is, is an absolutely crucial part of this. There's some, there's some absolutely um, essential elements to, to, to what we're doing. It all comes down to digital manufacturing technology. I mean, we're, we're getting the kids coming from schools these days with um, full CAD capabilities, with incredible programming tech, uh, you know, possibilities that they're learning from their schools um, and coming out looking for high tech jobs. They're not always there. What we're trying to address with our micro factories is if we can put them into regional areas um, or, or, or supplement maker spaces with a micro factory in regional areas to provide that sort of high tech employment in those in those areas where we're seeing and in, in Australia we've got regional areas with high amounts of youth unemployment we see addressing that by being able to create this micro factory structure in those regional areas now in terms of the tools and stuff that they need that's going to be ever changing and again the micro factory structure suits that without having massive capital investment in, in sort of large scale CNCs and so forth, the incremental adoption of different 3D printing technologies can actually sort of pivot quite quickly. You know, we, we're seeing, you know, 3D printing as, a, as, a, as an industry maturing to the point where we're not just printing PLA um, on basic FDM machines like we were five or six years ago. We're seeing binder jetting. We're seeing, um, you know, metal 3D printing sort of coming online more affordably. We're seeing all these advances. And I think one of the, one of the great things of the makerspaces and the micro factories is that they're allowed to pivot quite quickly without being sort of married to a five-year sort of uh, write-down cost on, on multi-million dollar equipment. I heard a bing then. <laughs> Was that bell for me to stop? Oops. So, um, yeah, so, I, you know, listen, the, I think um, in terms of the technology that we're seeing, we're seeing sort of, you know, rapid changes um, in, in the market. We, we need to respond to those. Now, now, robotics is certainly one. One of the challenges in robotics, absolutely, and you've addressed it a moment ago, Andrea, has been the cost. The cost of entry has really not allowed um, SMEs yeah. to be part of that um, you know, discussion of robots. And we're hoping to bring that down to that SME level. The same way a human would. No API Oops. is needed. And you can turn your garage into your own personal factory. Sorry, guys. I, go I was trying to share the cameras. video, but my laptop's up frozen up. And... Uh, so I, can't I can hear actually... my colleague James's <laughs> voice in the background. Yes, I know. I just can't actually move the, the, this around. Would would uh, one of you uh, like to screen share and play it, and I'll I'll mute again. Yeah, I'll I'll do that. Just bear with me for a sec. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, I'll I'll share what what this is basically is um, one of our. Um, uh, one of our head engineers, one of our co-founders, in fact, um, put um, together a, an automation project. I've I I sort of mentioned it before with our um, uh, with our robot. I'm struggling to wish I had it to hand. Um, actually, I think my colleague has already put it into the uh, to the list here. Um, okay, here we go. I'll share this. Uh, okay. So, 
So what you're, what you're seeing here, um, are, are you able to see that vision, guys? Yeah. Um, what you're seeing here is a, the Glowforged um, um, laser cutter that we brought in-house. Um, we've managed to create a, a roll feed system within the unit there. Um, and, you know, like I say, this isn't a, a, a product that we're, 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 we're launching. It, it was simply an experiment of using a human user interface. As you can see there, we've, we have a Dexter unit that is um, uh, uh, fitted with a, a suction cup. Um, which, which um, James Wigglesworth designed himself. Um, what it is, instead of even going into the API of this unit and trying to do it that way, what we got, we can see the Dexter is picking up the, um, uh, the face shields as we're cutting them, but it's also pressing the, the button on the unit itself. Um, so we've, we've basically replaced the human in this, in this scenario because obviously we wanted to be able to pack these units without any cross-contamination of a human at all. And we've managed to do that. Now, what we, what we basically did was use one of our standard robots. Um, this is the Dexter HDI you're seeing there. Um, we, we fitted it with the, um, the suction cup, which is like a, a manual suction cup. We're, we're actually not even using any, any air on that particular one. Um, and we also then used the guts of an old um, um, uh, Dexter to uh, reverse engineer that to create the roll feed sort of forwarding mechanism. So yeah, it's a, it's a you know ultimately we we see sort of things like this where you've got that sort of dull, dangerous, and repetitive um, sort of work with people actually doing something again and again in a really similar way that we can we can actually replace those those sorts of repetitive dull uh, jobs where you need, you know, things on running on 24 hours, for example. So, so James was able to sort of rig this together um, and he, he literally did this in about three days. Um, and this was at the height of um, the, the lockdown, basically, and in Las Vegas, you know, in our little factory there. So he's, he says he's got, he's got the vision systems there um, that'll allow the, the vision system can tell when the green light goes on for the button to be pressed again, ready to, to do that. So like, again, we didn't even bother to get into the, to the API of this. Now, now, yeah, whilst this isn't a, uh, a product that we are going to be sort of releasing at any stage, we, we're not endorsed by Glowforge, to, uh, I have to say. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I advise against someone doing this. This is actually invalidates their warranty on the machine. However, what we are seeing is that, you know, there are other sort of basic um, automation tasks that need a human on them at the moment that we can take. So we, we, what we can do is we can actually put a two-armed robot as a less affordably, sorry, sorry, more affordably than um, some of our uh, automation, um, you know, opposition in, the, in you know, KUKA and ABB and these big, big players would charge a hell of a lot for a two-armed robot. What we're seeing is, is the two arms give you a lot more flexibility to take over those human-centric sort of jobs that you're going to find inside a sort of a, an automation space. Um, again, this is not to take away jobs. This is to actually augment and to replace those dull, dangerous and dirty jobs. Yeah, and certainly we find that robots are not being used to replace people, they're being used to replace job vacancies that companies have trouble filling. And, you know, certainly the number of vacancies in the field of both robotics and advanced manufacturing and manufacturing just generally is climbing and is expected to climb significantly over the next five years, particularly as um, we were seeing supply, supply chain and manufacturing uh, manufacturing reshoring, but in the light of all of the supply chain problems recently, there is an even greater incentive for manufacturing reshoring. Dan, we've got just a couple of minutes. You posted a link to a video as well. Is that something that um, you can show us some of? Uh, no, that I, actually I was just in the Q and A, which seems to be a different place in the chat. Um, I yes. posted the information on the dyes and some some sources. Oh. And, uh, and the to make your own die that I was able to uh, put. Um, oh, I see. They, somebody said that I can't post the ch links. I'm answering live. I'm trying this thing. I don't know what this means, but okay. I, I think you just have to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then it gets rid of the question. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the key. I am gonna copy and paste that into the uh, the chat as soon as I figure out 
all, pan all panelists and attendees. There we go, and I'll I'll post that. So, um, and certainly I would I, I I would love to stay in touch with anybody who's interested in this topic, and I shared my email in the chat, and Dan and Jason have shared theirs as well, and I think that this is the start of a really interesting discussion where we look at what are the 21st century tools for maker spaces and things have been evolving so rapidly and i believe that spaces like maker spaces can serve such a great role as an innovation hub as well and i mean i don't believe that everybody needs to want to play with robots or with die cutters or with all of the tools involved but key thing is that a space a makerspace collects a community of people with a range of interests and skills so it can just create a place in the community where we can all learn more about what we can do today you know 21st century tools are changing so rapidly and um yes and i i do think that we have an important role as i said right at the very start in the COVID crisis, I've seen the power of individuals banding together to make hundreds of thousands of pieces of PPE. And in fact, if you look at Guy Cavalcanti's open source medical supplies, the tallies that he's keeping just within the network there, I believe it was 8.7 million pieces of PPE created by the network in multiple countries around the world. That is an incredible number of it. That's the how of makers, all individuals connecting together as community. And I believe we're just coming right up on 345. So I don't think the, the talk will continue much longer, if at all. So I do want to thank you all for joining us and, you know, have a happy maker fair. And thank you, Andrew. It was, it's been thank a great you, Jason to and Dan. I've been looking forward to getting you two together to chat. Too. <laughs> yeah, we need to have a chat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. And uh, well, good morning from me, or happy morning from me, and uh, and have a great afternoon over there, everyone. Oh, wonderful. Okay, we're going to finish the meeting now. Bye now.